Good evening and welcome to Pathfinder Phase 2. My name is Sahan Tendakon and I'll be your moderator for the evening. Thank you for joining with us and we hope you find this webinar valuable and productive. Please keep your video on as this is, a, as this is an interactive session and we will love to see all your faces. And make sure you keep your microphones on mute because and unmute only when you need to speak. To brief you on the agenda of the evening, we will be having two sessions. One, an analysis on what lies ahead for arts candidates after their A-level examinations. That will take place in the first 30 minutes of the session. Afterward, followed by another 30 minute session for what lies ahead for candidates of commerce. You can direct your questions to the panel by sending a direct message to Wakish or Savit on the chat box and we will attend to them at the end of both sessions. And now, without further ado, let's get started. First, to welcome all of you today, I invite Interactor Janiti from the Interact Club of Colombo North to deliver the welcome speech. Janiti, over to you. Thank you, Sahan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Project Pathfinder is a project organized by the Interact Clubs of Ananda College, Colombo North, Gautami Balika Vidyalaya, Kingswood College, Mahamaya Girls College, Maliadeva College, Nalanda College, and St. Thomas's Bandara Villa, along with the Road Track Clubs of Excellence and University Alumni. The first phase of this project was based on skills needed post COVID and how to score at interviews. This time, we took another common issue among the boys and girls who are doing their A levels or are already done with their A levels into consideration. That is, what should be done after A levels? What are the paths available? And what's the best path to choose? As today's session will be focused on the streams of commerce and arts, we have here, we have with us here today our distinguished panelists, Mr. Uvi Narya Ratna and Ms. Chiranti Sena Nayaka. Well then, I won't keep you all waiting. I hope all of you here today will find this webinar useful and productive. Thank you. Thank you, Janiti. Again, if you have any questions regarding each session, please do drop them down in the chat box to Savit or Vakisha, and we will be directing them at the end of the two sessions. And now it's finally time for the first session, career guidance for arts candidates. It's a totally wrong misconception with your parents that art stream candidates don't have a good career scope. Art stream candidates have a good scope in different career options like journalism, civil service examinations, you name it. But how wide is the range anyway? To answer this, I now invite Ms. Chiranti Senanayaka, an attorney in law, youth empowerment advocate, regional ambassador for South Asia, for the Global Youth Aspiration Program, Women Deliver Young Leader of 2020, and the recipient of the Diana Award 2020. Ms. Senanayaka also received the Activist Award for the year 2020 in Sri Lanka from the National Youth Service Council and Women in Management, and is currently following a LLM in International Economic Law, Justice and Development at Burbeck University, London. Needless to say, that's not all she has achieved but I believe you all would rather give ear to her than me. Ms. Chiranti, over to you. Thank you so much, Sahan, and thank you very much to um, the Interact Clubs as well as um, the Rotary Club of University Alumni for organizing this session. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, let me just first share my screen to actually start off with the session. I have a small presentation prepared for you. I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay, fantastic. Um, Sahan, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, okay, amazing. Um, so I think uh, events like Pathfinder are absolutely crucial for post A-level students, simply because uh, post A-levels or life straight after A-levels is um, for most of us, the majority of us, quite a chaotic and a very unplanned experience. So 
that's why I actually termed the, the presentation that I'm making in the next 30 minutes, self-discovery after A-levels. And I will be focusing my, the, my conversation on the arts and languages stream because I also studied in arts and languages for A-levels. So I actually followed economics, geography and English literature. I'm um, so using my experience um, and I'm quite old now, so I'm 25. So using the experience I've had for the past like six years or so, I would, um, you know, perhaps humbly share and convince you that as an arts and language graduate, your future is assured and you have all the competency to have a successful career as well as, um, you know, um, success, successful part um, as arts and language student. So to start off, um, these are my main points of discussion. So I'm going to talk about what really post A-level life is like. And I um, actually, if you talk about post A-levels, I always refer to it as a panic zone that we often go through. I'm talking about that experience and I will talk, talk about a few myths that are associated with being a post A-level student. Then we'll talk about this philosophy that has really helped me during my post A-level life called Ikigai. So that's a Japanese philosophy, I'll get into it. Uh, later. And then we'll focus on what really is the modern job market like. Um, since this is a career guidance program, I will be um, sort of gearing it towards employability and career opportunities. And we'll also talk about what really does the modern job market look for in an employee, or even if you are going down a path of self-employment, what really is a job market like for someone um, who is either an employee or an employer. And then I'll talk about how Arts and languages actually affords you endless career opportunities. And um, that also brings me to why it is important that you narrow down on your choice in your post A level life. And then I will be answering a few specific questions that I think the organizers receive through the registration form that uh, is difficult to sort of categorize into the previous topics. So to start off with the first one, which is life in a panic zone. Um, so I'm going to start off with a quote. I know that's a very cliche way to begin, but this quote is from someone who's not very famous and is perhaps a quote that encapsulates or captures the main message that I'm trying to get across, which is there is this American uh, songwriter and composer called um, Albert Ebert, right? And he says that to be lost is as legitimate a part of your process as being found. So why I find this quote to be very, uh, to, uh, why I personally connect with this quote is because um, I'm, I'm very sure that one aspect of being Sri Lankan is that your immediate support systems, it could be your family, it could be your friends, or it could even be your uh, you know, partner. They all sort of expect you to have a certain path in life to have everything figured out. And, and success is often measured based on how planned your life is, especially in South Asian countries. But I think um, a, a commonality that those of our generation experience is that we, we understand that being lost is a very universal experience and it is all right because we're in a process of finding ourselves. Um, so, and I think this quote actually captures uh, what really post level life is like. Because for me, as well as for many others who I think are now, a lot of the youngsters who are part of the organizing committee who are doing their bachelors would also agree with me that straight after A-levels, life is uh, rather confusing. You constantly felt overwhelmed. You felt as if you were like lost in translation and you sometimes even felt very alone. You felt confused. And the first thing I want to share with everyone here is because this is not something that I heard through the career guidance programs that I went through. What I want to tell you is being lost and being, feeling overwhelmed in your post A level life is a very universal experience. So I'm just going to actually show you uh, how universal it is. So we have 163 participants here. I want you to actually just drop a message in the chat box in answer to this question that I'm going to present to you. And you can actually see that you are not alone when it comes to being in the panic zone straight after A-levels. So the question I have is, how many of you here, especially post A-level students here, feel as if that life is too overwhelming, that you don't have a direction in life right now, and that so many people expect you to know what is going on with your life? Do you feel overwhelmed and you feel um, confused? If you have are going through some sort of experiences of this nature, can you just put a yes in the chat box? I just want to sort of see what the general pulse of the audience is. 
Um, and I want to sort of see whether uh, this is a common experience because this was a common experience, I guess, for my generation and I went through it as well. So, I mean, we are getting quite a number of responses. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, so this also reassures to you that this is not something that you are going through alone. And this is not something that is unique to you. There is nothing wrong with you. You are not, let's say, weaker just because you are having these feelings. That it is actually something that is quite common to most uh, post A level students. Sorry. Right. Um, so uh, I just actually put a small um, example also there. So, you know, I'm sure in your batches, you would have certain friends who from, let's say, they were eight years old or nine years old, always knew they wanted to be a doctor. And because they actually got really good grades and they did, um, you know, science for their A-levels and now they're awaiting results. And they seem to sort of have everything figured out. There are people who actually have a certain set career path in mind even whilst they're in school. But trust me, even though they may also be going through certain, you know, experiences of being, being overwhelmed and being lost in translation, because what the, the frank truth is, as you grow older, your wants and your needs change. So for example, when I was younger, I wanted to actually be an archeologist, but I ended up in the legal field and now, and now I'm actually um, into academics, especially legal academics. And my passion is what I call sustainable law. So how do you make legal development um, linked to sustainable development? So from archeology, span I ended up talking about sustainable law. So that within the past, let's say 10 to 15 years, my needs and my wants as a person, my aims as a person completely changed. So just know that that is going to happen to you as well. You are also going to go through a period of growth and that is already natural and that is part of life, right? And why we all feel that way straight after A-levels is because firstly, you no longer have a life that is planned. When you were in school, you know that when you finish grade seven, you have to go to grade eight. Um, and you know that when the bell rang for the interval, that that was the time you actually stopped being in the classroom and went out into the playground and had some fun. You know that straight after school, you have, let's say, cricket practice from four o'clock to six o'clock. Um, so life was very planned when you were in school and it was always a step-by-step -step progression and things were set. Um, so that is one reason why you're feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling confused because that step-by-step -step experience is no longer there when you are out of school, right? You are sort of thrown into reality. And I really believe that our present education system doesn't prepare us for real life. And I think that's something that all of you would agree with me. Um, so that's the first reason why we feel very overwhelmed. Then the second reason is because we don't have a set schedule. We don't know what really uh, we will be doing at this particular time on this particular day, like before, because when you were in school, you had, you know, so, you had so many commitments. You either had to go for tuition classes, you had to go for drama practices, and, you know, you were constantly busy. And you're now in a stage where there is a sudden drop in terms of process and in terms of planned scheduling. And the third thing, I believe, and this is actually, I think, one of the biggest contributing factors, your immediate support system, like your family, your friends, or your partner, would, you know, always ask you, okay, so what's next? Okay, fine, you're waiting for eleven results. Are you thinking of starting a job? Are you, for example, let's say, going to volunteer your time? And, I mean, a question I got is, because I come from... Um, community that I call the KGB community, not like the, the Russian secret service, but it's a Kandy and Govigam Buddhist community. So I have been, you know, having this conversation about marriage since I was 18 years old, because we come from a rather, I wouldn't say strict, but a relatively traditional upbringing. Um, so that was a conversation I always used to have with my parents straight after school. They used to ask me, when are you getting married? When are you going to give us grandchildren? So, I mean, that level of pressure that is exerted on you to have a set path after A-levels always makes post A-level life very chaotic and a panic zone. So what I believe is, and this is something I'm going to share from my experience, when you are in your post A-level time period, you either have two, two choices. One is you can actually get lost in all of this chaos or this, this panic zone that you're in. Or the other choice is that you actually use this chaos and this lack of direction to your advantage. And I will tell you what I mean by the second one. So now that we've agreed that post A-level life is actually life in the panic zone, let's go to 
yes, talking about certain myths that are associated with post A level life, right? So because why I wanted to especially focus on this segment is because so many of us believe these myths to be true, and that actually leads to our unhappiness. It leads to us not perhaps making choices that are beneficial for us, making choices driven by other external factors. So I thought it is very important for us to talk about certain myths that are associated with post A levels and. I'm going to be as honest with you because when we had career guidance programs, we used to have actually people from companies who used to come and tell us how amazing it is to work in a corporate. We had people who, you know, were high achievers who used to tell us that they always had their life figured out. And I want to be very honest with you and tell you that that is not the case and that it is okay. And you are able to use your lack of direction to your advantage. So that's why I wanted to share these myths with you. So the first myth that I wanted to share is that, um, you know, you are told that your advanced level subjects, what you choose, whether you do arts and languages or whether you do commerce or whether you do sciences, will be a sole determinant, will be the sole deciding factor of your higher studies, right? And I think this was something that Sahan also brought up in the introduction where he said that a lot of people are told that if you follow arts and languages, you technically don't have a future because it's not a very theoretical and a science oriented subject. I'm going to tell you that your arts and language, if you are doing arts and languages, that does not mean that you have to stick to conventional, uh, you know, occupations or careers that are there for people with arts and languages, who did the arts and language stream, right? Because why I say that is because now if let's take a look at how we, um, you know, uh, categorize arts and languages in the Sri Lankan education system, right? So what you see is, you, you would notice that even economics, which is a predominantly commerce and transaction-based social science is also categorized under arts and languages. So when I did my Bachelor of Arts in Economics, I studied at the Faculty of Arts, right? Um, so that, that is technically something that is very questionable because you're putting economics in the same subject as let's say arts and aesthetics. And you have languages and arts being combined into the same basket as well. So just know that simply because you did arts and languages does not mean that all hope is lost. And also that doesn't mean that your subjects are going to purely decide what is going to be your end occupation, right? I mean, I've met people who've done their basic degree in uh, microbiology, then they did their master's in peace and conflict resolution, and now they're actually working as, you know, peace builders in the community. So you see that there are very contrasts, like there are people who start off at one point, then they go to a different, uh, you know, a career or study option, and then they finally find their calling. Right? So just know that your advanced level or examinations are just a qualifier. It's simply the first step, or if you consider all of us to be this first step, it's simply the second step. And it's a qualifier, it's just a metric. That's the first myth I wanted to talk about. Then the second myth I wanted to talk about is that advanced levels and the results you get in A levels is going to be the, a very high uh, metric or measurement of how competent you are as a person and how talented you are as a person. I wish I knew this when I was your age, because in my case, what happened was my father is a lawyer and he was very, very confident about the fact that I'm going to get into law, I'm going to practice. Um, so it was as if like my path was technically set, right? And I remember I actually um, did economics, geography and English literature. And my I got two A's and a B. And I was supposed to go to law faculty, then I was supposed to finish law faculty, I was then supposed to do my attorneys, and I was supposed to take over my father's practice, he actually practiced in Cape Cod. Um, so that was the, the rather the planned life in my head, right? And uh, so when the results came, I got two A's and a B, and my Z score was 1.892. And the cutoff mark for law faculty was 1.9. So I missed my uh, law faculty entrance by 0 0.008, right? So a decimal mark, you know, completely changed my life. And uh, I, for the longest time, for a year or so, I actually felt as if that the fact that I got a B in my advanced level results was a reflection of the fact that I was incompetent, that I wasn't suitable for the legal field. And I spent about two months feeling terribly sorry for myself 
So I'm going to tell you that please don't go through this experience that I went through. Know that your advanced level results is not a measurement of how competent and how talented you are. And uh, sometimes, right, if you don't essentially get into the, the faculty or the university of your choice and what you really wanted to, um, probably something very surprising and pleasant happens otherwise. Because I actually ended up studying at three different institutions and doing three separate degrees at the same time. This is not for me to say or to boast about myself, but that experience completely shaped who I am. And I'm so thankful because otherwise I would have been very restricted to one field. Right? So that's a second myth that I wanted to share with you. Then the third thing I wanted to share with you uh, is that, um, Right. Uh, this, I think there is a question also posted here. I just quickly get back to the question at the end. I'm so sorry, um, whoever shared the question. Then the third thing is about the third myth I wanted to share with you is if um, if you actually don't get a place in local university, please don't think that you are out of options in life. I'll speak about this a little in depth later, but um, if you take a look at the local university entrance statistics, right? only 0.1% of everyone who sits for advanced levels in Sri Lanka actually get local university placement. So just know that it is very selective and just because you don't make that 0.1% list, that does not mean that you are out of options, right? Because in Sri Lanka, according to a study, a study that was done in by Learn Asia, in 2012, there were 17 public universities 10 public non-UGC universities. Those are universities that don't fall with the University Grants Commission. And there were 46 registered private universities in Sri Lanka. So the education uh, market of Sri Lanka is diversifying. And just know that just because you don't get placement in local university does not mean that you don't have options in life, right? Then the fourth myth I wanted to talk about is this, this, this is to actually prevent you from getting into the same mentality when you go to university. So many people will tell you that the sole purpose of your university or undergraduate education should be to get a first class or a second upper. I'm going to tell you from my personal experience that the uh, the job market as well as even aspects like higher studies has moved away from a purely academic point of view, right? They, the world doesn't, you know, revolve around purely academic results anymore and they look for a wholesome individual. So I would actually say use your undergraduate and university experience or your first job as an opportunity to really discover yourself rather than aiming for a qualifier or a class uh, as I'm thinking that is the only thing that you have to go after. Then the fifth myth I wanted to talk about is, I'm just simultaneously checking the chat as well. Um, the fifth myth I want to talk about is, life after A-levels, people will say that it has to be planned. And that if you don't have a plan, you are going to end up failing in life, right? Um, so just know that there is no way that a student who is straight after school is going to know what they want in life. And as I said before, it's a process that's changing. And so what you need to do is, I'll talk about this further in my next slide, you have to use your post a level life as a self-discovery phase to identify and narrow down your options rather than knowing strictly this is the path that you need to go down. And then the next aspect is, people will also tell you that the present day job market only looks for qualification. and that's the most important employability factor. And I'm telling you that is not the case. When you go for a present day interview, a reformed interview, it can be even in a corporate, it can be in an NGO. They are, they are actually, all the interviews that I've gone for, they've never asked me what my final degree result is. Did I get a second upper? Did I get a first class? They've always checked for my emotional quotient, EQ. What they mean by that is they would give me a scenario in the workplace. So I remember when I actually applied for a human resource management position, they told me, imagine if the trade union that is there in your company comes and tells you they're going on strike tomorrow, what would you do? So they would actually look for my capability to respond to a situation. And that's why I'm telling you that the present day job market doesn't only look at qualifications, right? Then the seventh myth that I, the final myth I want to talk about is that if you do arts and languages and you don't have a 
option or a future unless you do either law or economics like a conventionally employable um, type of you know course and i'm telling you that is not the case i will talk to you about the immense endless opportunities that are available for you so moving on now that we've actually spoken about the myths that are associated with um, you know, being a post a -level student, let me just talk to you about what really post a -level life is supposed to be like. So especially in Sri Lanka, if you're applying for a local university, you would know that there is a two-year wait period, right? If you are applying for a private university for higher education, or even if you are doing a repeat A-level exam, there is so much of waiting time before you start your next chapter in life, where before you, you know, jump to your undergraduate education and you start figuring out what your potential career paths are. There is about between one year to sometimes even two years of time that is given to you. So think of post a level life as a gift of time, an opportunity to really find who you are and to find your ikigai. So this is a Japanese philosophy where Iki actually means life, right? And um, so I'm just going to refer to my notes here as well. So Iki means life and Gai means realization of your expectation. So that's what Iki Gai means. So when you condense it, it's simply talking about the meaning or the purpose of you being here, right? What really gets you out of bed in the morning. And what's really interesting about Iki Gai is they say that your passion, mission, vocation, and profession are four different things. Why this is important is because we used to grow up in a philosophy where they would tell us that unless and otherwise your what you do for a living, what gives you money is actually the only thing you want to do is your biggest passion. You are not really happy or you're not really living life, right? Now, if you take a look at um, autobiographies written by, let's say, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or, you know, the big entrepreneurs, they would say that in order for you to actually be a successful person, your profession has to be exactly your passion. And the idea of Ikigai is very different because, and this is why I think this is very appropriate for our generation. It talks about how, what you love to do, right, which is your passion and what the world needs from you. That's your mission. What can you give back to the world, right? And your vocation, what are you good at? For example, are you a good coder? Are you good at singing? Are you, let's say, good at designing? Versus what you do for a living, which is your profession, are four different spheres, okay? So just because you don't really have a, just because you don't engage in a profession that is that you're absolutely passionate about, because just know that so many of us start our first jobs for logistical reasons, because we have financial problems. It's not because your first job straight after A-levels is going to be your dream job. Um, so just know that in that situation that you are not failing just because your profession doesn't coincide with your passion. So that's the first philosophy I wanted to share with you. And the second philosophy is about really using post A-levels as a learning zone. So psychologists argue that human beings have three zones. So the first is the comfort zone. That's basically your habits, what makes you comfortable, the food you like to eat, who you are, um, you know, your set ways are your comfort zone. And beyond the comfort zone is your learning zone, you know, where you expand your experiences, where you are able to go through new things. So that's the second phase. And the third phase, some people call it the danger zone. Some people call it the magic zone or the magical zone. So it really depends on who you're speaking to. But it's important to consider post a levels as a learning zone, a gift of time that's given to you to really learn new things and to discover yourself. Because this time that you have, you're not going to get back again. When you get into your undergraduate education, your life is going to be focused on that. When you start your career, your life is going to be focused with career commitments. When you start a family, family commitments are going to take over. So this is a very unique period in your life where you have the time to invest in yourself. So I actually request you to consider post levels as such, right? This brings me to the next very career focused point, which is what really is the modern job market like and how do you face the modern job market? So the first thing we need to understand is we live the present day global economy is what we call a knowledge based transactional economy, right? So what we mean by knowledge based transactional economy is this sounds very confusing. So I'm just going to simply explain it to you. A knowledge-based transaction economy is 
the current economy still actually values specialization. They do want you to be focused and specialized in a particular field. So that's why it's knowledge based. But it's very transactional, right? It's driven by, you know, uh, the philosophy of capitalism. It's driven by, uh, you know, transactional economics where you buy and sell, it's demand and supply. So that's the type of economy that the modern day job market is based on, right? But in this case, just because it is knowledge-based and transactional does not mean that the modern day job market only looks for academic qualifications. It does not mean that the modern day job market only looks for grades. So what they really look for is, they are looking um, for a wholesome individual and certain skills and qualification uh, or like soft skills. I'll talk about that a little later. But understanding that the modern day job market isn't what it was 50 years ago. It wasn't what it was when our parents were in the job market where they looked at mainly, do you have a degree? How many years of experience do you have? They really look at higher education and your undergraduate degree as a mere entrance point. Because now know that Sri Lanka is outputting 20 times more graduates today than it did 10 years ago, right? So we're having an influx of graduates, people who have undergraduate degrees. So A-levels is no longer the basic qualification. You have, they require a higher educational qualification to enter into the job market, right? That is not to say that you can't find work if you actually, let's say, don't get through A-levels, that is not to say that you're not worthy just because you don't get through A-levels. Please don't get me wrong. But that's to say that higher education qualification gets you through the door. And it's something important to have in my experience and opinion. Right? But what, as I was saying before, present day employers really look at people who fit into their workplace culture rather than qualified employees. When you are being interviewed, you are far more likely now to get hired if you are a better fit for the company. Let's say if you are a better team player, if you have, let's say, a more pleasant personality, if you are, let's say, uh, respectful of the interview board, as opposed to someone who, let's say, has a master's degree or even is studying for their higher education, like a PhD, right? Um, um, so just note that the present day job market is more focused on finding a productive and a workplace fit employee rather than a qualified employee, right? Which is why I think post a levels is the perfect opportunity to make yourself stronger or to grow as people by equipping yourself with soft skills and what we call auxiliary employability factors, right? Additional employability factors. So let's take a look at what these soft skills and additional employability factors are. So I've just listed a few here. And I think someone is actually drawing on the screen because I can see a few. Um, I don't know whether that's actually me. I oh, know. Thank God. Thankfully, that's not me. Um, so let's talk about a few of the employability factors that the modern day job market is really looking for. Right. So one thing that they're looking for is public speaking and presentation skills. The present day job market really wants someone who can go in front of a group of, let's say, five members of the director board and share with them, let's say, the current sales or uh, what really a project that you conducted was like. So they're looking for people with public speaking capabilities and presentation skills. And trust me, even if you are someone who has a very shy personality, that does not mean you can't speak in public. So one thing that you can do in your post day level life is to let's say join a Toastmasters club or to join a community that you know improves each other's speaking and presentation skills. Watch YouTube videos and TED talks on public speaking and presentation. So that's one skill you can develop. Then another skill you can develop is community mobilization because when you go for interviews and when you go to meet your employers, they will ask you questions like, can you show us and prove to us how you have uh, you know, taken a group of people and move them or mobilize them towards a particular goal. So if you have time on your hands and if you have a few hours, you can volunteer in a local youth organization or you can join a youth movement in your area because that shows that you are focused on community development and you can mobilize or, you know, increase the movement of a community. Then a third aspect the job market looks for is team spirit and productive contribution. 
have you, for example, let's say done sports or have you been part of the school Havisa band or have you joined um, your university and been part of, let's say, the Rotary Club or the Isaac Club? Are you, do you show that you are a good team player and that you can productively contribute to something? Um, then they also value multitasking. Multitasking is the capacity where you can handle several commitments at the same time. And multitasking is a skill that you develop. I really don't think multitasking is something that people are born with. It's something that you develop out of practice. So you can do that by, let's say, you know, while you're studying, for example, doing a part-time job. Um, so when I was studying, I actually used to coach schools in English debating. So that, you know, when I go to an interview and when I talk about how I worked and studied at the same time, that shows my ability to multitask, right? And there are a few other skills here as well, like leadership and capacity to take initiative. Have you, have you been in a situation where you can actually prove that you are a leader? Um, do you think outside of the box? That is, do you know, if you see a problem, can you find an innovative solution? So you would have noticed that in when I was talking about each of these soft skills and auxiliary um, employability factors, I kept using the word proof because I want to be very honest with you and tell you that when you go to an interview, you have to demonstrate why you have these qualities, right? It's no longer a situation where when you go for an interview, they're going to check your certificates, uh, the number of, uh, let's say, uh, athletics meets you've been placed in and then think that you are actually suitable for their company. They're going to want you to show in your answers why really you have all of these qualities. And that's actually the harsh reality of the present day job market. So I'm going to actually tell you that use your post A-level life as an opportunity to get these skills, to really you know, strengthen these skills, because then it's an investment for your career straight after your undergraduate or higher education. So that's really what the job market looks like. So if your, let's say, parents tell you that the job market is looking for someone with a first class, or if your parents tell you that you have to, you know, quickly get into your master's straight after doing your undergraduate degree, just know that I respectfully disagree with them, that the job market has evolved now to look for people that are wholesome and that are a good fit for the company or, let's say, the organization, right? Um, next, let's talk about how you have endless career opportunities. So why I think this is important is because I, the, still in Sri Lanka, you, your parents would tell you, not just your parents, your the generation that's above us would tell you that you have to find a particular type of job, that you have to find a profession and not essentially just a career. So a profession is either be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. Um, so very conventional sort of professions, right? And um, the, the sad thing is our arts and languages stream and just our advanced level examinations in general are bracketed to fit to that conventional thinking that if you do arts and languages, you have to go into law. If you do, let's say biology, you have to be a doctor. If you do, let's say, physics, you have to either go into the mathematics stream or you have to go into uh, the sciences, right? So it's very, you know, baskets are very focused on conventional jobs. But if you actually go to an online career planner or if you go to a job portal, there are 12,000 12, different career options, right? 12,000 different jobs that you can do, um, you know, simply as a human being. It can, and the funny thing is, I've actually just listed 10 jobs here that you can do as a person who has followed arts and languages for A-levels, right? And none of these include your conventional lawyer or conventional, let's say, um, um, I mean, lecturer or academic. I mean, you can be a content strategist. A content strategist is actually one of the highest paying jobs in the world now. So that's basically where you actually write content and write public relation material articles for companies, right? So for example, I, I would tell you one of my friends, he's a content strategist and every month he earns between four and five lakhs. And he's a freelancer, right? But he's a content strategist and he did arts and languages. And then you can actually be a journalist. You can join a paper. And if you are someone who likes talking about the truth, if you're passionate about investigation, you can be a journalist or you can be a researcher. There are so many think tanks that have started in Sri Lanka, like Advocata, Verite Research, IPS, 
you can join one of these think tanks. And if you are someone who is good with research and this space performance, that's an option for you. You can also, let's say, um, join a non-governmental organization as a project officer or an outreach coordinator. You can start your own business. So there are so many opportunities that are available to you. And I want you to know that just because you studied in arts and languages does not mean that you have to go down a very strict path, right? But the thing of having the thing about having endless opportunities when you have so many choices, it's as difficult as having no choices at all, right? Because it's so easy to get lost and feel overwhelmed. I mean, there are twelve thousand different careers. What do I choose, right? Um, so this is why I would say that you have to use your post A level life to narrow down what your career options are and how you can do that. I'll sort of show you. This is also based on my own personal experience in, in the, next set, the next segment of the conversation about how do you really narrow down your career options in your post A level life. So this is what I did. So I actually now didn't get into law faculty and uh, I didn't exactly meet my parents' expectations and they were not very happy with me. So until I actually started my LLB with the University of London, what I did was I had about a year, right? And then I was um, staying at, I, I was at home for the first two weeks straight after A-levels. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I didn't get, get into the path that I wanted to get into. What do I do? At this point, what I actually did was, I, I actually, I um, kid you not, but uh, what I actually did was, I had a year before I started my LLB because I liked learning the law. The law made a lot of sense to me, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to practice. And this was an argument that was always there in my house. You have a good personality, you can talk, you're bad at mathematics. So those are the three qualifiers, qualifiers to be a lawyer. You had a good personality, you are good with your public speaking skills and you're bad at maths. I was, I was terrible at maths because I had dyscalculus. So dyscalculus is where I get confused between number eight and zero. So numbers that look alike, I, I can't differentiate, right? So to, to pass my O-level mathematics, I memorized equations and how exactly they could be solved. So that's how I got through. Um, so there was always argument about how I didn't want to practice. And what I did was I took that year and I actually did 20 different jobs. I'm, I'm not even joking. I just kept moving from job to job because I thought, okay, I can't figure out what I want, but at least I can figure out what I don't want. So I, I, I mean, I remember my the shortest job I've held is for exactly one day. There was an opportunity that was advertised by a leading company. I won't name what the company is for travel journalists. So I love, love traveling. I love writing. I was like, this is my ideal job. And I left Sunday Times and I applied for this job. And when I went on the first day, I was told that someone else will be doing the traveling and writing the first draft of the article. Then they'll send it across to me and I have to edit it. So basically I was stuck at the desk. So on that exact same day, I typed in my letter of resignation, I handed it and then I actually left the company. So like that, I actually had 20 different jobs. I worked as a journalist, I worked as a radio personality. I um, worked at, I did my internship at a think tank. I um, then I worked at an NGO. So I did different, I took different experiences because I wanted to figure out what I don't want. And just know, I, I want to honestly tell you, I had the luxury of doing that because my parents were uh, helping me out financially to some extent, but all these jobs I did were paying jobs because they couldn't fully sustain me financially. But there may be instances where you won't have that luxury because you have to find money for yourself or be financially stable. So in such a situation, what I would say is um, find a job or perhaps a paying job, but really try and figure out who you are and whether that is what you want in your post day level life. So there are two ways to narrow down your career path. One way is to fit, decide what you want to do, or the other way is what I did, decide what you don't want, right? But in either case, whichever pathway you go through, you have to actually realize a few things. The first thing is, in this is purely my uh, humble request to you, understand that your career path, what you choose to do with your life is your own choice. It is not essentially the choice of your parents. It is not essentially the choice of your boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not the choice of your, you know, neighboring auntie who only calls you whenever to, to let's say, hear your A-level results or to ask you whether what you're doing with your life, right? 
Um, so it's none of their choices because when you are in a post A level life, it's so easy to think that those external factors actually matter. Unless and otherwise you're going down a wrong path. Let's say you are thinking of finding employment as a drug dealer. I mean, unless and otherwise you're going down a wrong path, just know that your career option is actually your own choice. And that you need to listen to what you want as the person in your post A level life to decide what your career is. And the second thing I want to share with you is that deciding your career path is through self reflection and it's actually through trial and error. Your first job, I will state that later as well, the first job you do after A levels is not going to be your dream job. This is an accusation against a lot of millennials that they expect that to find their dream job straight after A levels. They expect life not to be hard. And but that's that, that's the truth, right? You are not going to land, let's say, your dream job straight after you get through A levels because you are just out, you just completed your secondary education. And you're competing with people who have masters, who have 10 years professional experience. So just know that understanding what your career path is has a lot to do with self-reflection, always investing in yourself, cutting yourself off from everyone and asking yourself what makes you happy. Going into different career options and through trial and error realizing, are you happy or not? So, I, I mean, I always say this to a lot of young people, to realize whether you are going to be successful in a corporate environment, you have to work in a corporate environment. Otherwise, you can't decide for yourself, you know, prematurely that you're going to be bad working in a company or a corporate environment. And the next thing that is very important for us to understand is that your career ambitions actually change as you grow older. So I said this before as well. I started off wanting to be an archaeologist. Now I'm focusing on sustainable law. So those are completely different uh, you know, options. And your ambitions now are not going to be the same thing. Five years down the line is going to be very different 10 years down the line. So you have to be okay with your path changing and know that it's a common experience and that it is all right to have a fluid career path for the first few years between let's say 18 and 25 to figure out what you are truly passionate about right and then another thing is your career is actually a very strong determining factor of how happy you are so don't only look at career from a financial point of view because you apart from money you have to have some sense of satisfaction that actually keeps you going right um so yes um so i think i'm going a little over time i'm so sorry about that but just know that making your choice is purely your own thing, right? Your own personal choice. Um, so moving on to that, yes. So I'm going going to the end of my my presentation. These are a few, sorry, these are a few specific questions that we post um, through the the registration forms. The first one is, what really are the career opportunities that are available to fashion designers, right? So just know that fashion designing is a very up and coming field in Sri Lanka. And if you want to get into fashion designing, you have to actually have a qualification in fashion designing. So you can do it through Murdo University, where they have a fashion design course or a degree, or you can join AOD, which is a private institution. So that is actually where you would require qualification. And then you would have to go through internships and training opportunities to really get into the field, right? And while you're doing that, if you're thinking of going into fashion designing, I would say look at your portfolio, uh, look at your, you know, try and develop like a separate online portfolio with your pictures of, you know, designs that you have. And if you are thinking of starting your own clothing company, there are like platforms like Gucci and Shopify where you can start your own online or cloud company, right? Then the next question is uh, about embassies and qualifications required to secure employment in embassies so diplomatic employment is twofold you have ambassadorships and embassy employment ambassadorship to be an ambassador of a country you have to write the state administrative exams it's called paripalani vibhag in sinhala you have to write that and then start working at the ministry of foreign affairs but if you want to work in another country's embassy you can actually start with, let's say, an economics degree. You can start with a social science degree. You don't have to go through that administrative exam. So what I would say is to look at a social science degree that's focused on international relations. 
Um, then how many students are selected into local universities? So I answered that before. Only 0.1% get admission into local universities. And that was the case in 2019 as well. But if you want to know what your district or provincial cutoff is, you have to every year check the UGC website because the cutoff marks actually change. Then finally, how do you become a lawyer and an advocate? This is actually a little close to my heart. Here, I would say that to be a lawyer, you have two types of qualifications. You have the academic qualification, which is your degree in law, and then you have your attorney at law qualification, right? But if you're looking at your, uh, if you are thinking of practicing as a lawyer, you have to go get your attorney at law qualification. And in Sri Lanka, the only institution that has the power to give your attorney at law is Sri Lanka Law College. So you have to complete three years of Sri Lanka Law College to be an attorney at law. Now, to be an advocate, um, you know, if you want to be a volunteer, a social worker, then you have to decide what your calling is to try and identify which area you want to be an advocate in. And you would also have, once you decide what your area of passion is, then you would have to actually focus on uh, really joining a movement that works in that uh, particular area. Right. Then I'm just going to quickly go into my conclusion because I don't want to take too much of your time. And I know Uvin is waiting to share his experience as well. I would say as my last words, look at your post a level life as a self-discovery phase, as a phase where you're looking for yourself and, you know, understand that life has given you time, right? and to identify who you are as a person in the real world. So it's, it's very confusing for everyone, but you have to constantly ask yourself, are you happy? Do I really want to do this? Is this a better option? And you have to take control of your post day level life. Don't get overwhelmed by it and be completely lost in it. So thank you so much everyone for listening to me speak for 30 minutes and over 30 minutes, I think. I'm so sorry the organizers for taking this long. But this is a way, in, in case you want to contact me directly, these are just my um, you know, social media handles and my Gmail. Drop me an email and if you have specific personal questions you want to talk about, we can have a chat as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, I hope we all learned a lot through that wonderful session. Also, a quick reminder for those of you who are using the note option please don't please avoid doing so if you guys don't want to learn anything the you have the option of leaving no problem just don't be a hindrance for other people mm -hmm. moving on uh before going to the next se session a quick reminder if you have any questions from miss chiranti please do direct them to savito Vagisha and we can attend it and we can attend to them at the end i'd like i recommend directing them now itself because if you wait until the last moment to do so, we might not be able to attend your specific question as we might run out of time. We are on severe time restraints right now. Uh, now it's time for our second session, career guidance for commerce candidates. From accounting to managing, commerce is practically everywhere. When it comes to the core structure, commerce is generally regarded easy. Well, at least that's what the net said to me. Unlike the science subjects that require you to study continuously and extensively, commerce requires you to be clear with the basics and you're pretty much good to go. Again, not my words, that's what the internet told me. But then again, where to, why and how? These questions are never answered. And in order to answer them, we have with us today, assistant lecturer at the University of Peradeniya, Mr. Uvin Ayaratna. He was the best commerce student in Kingswood College Kandy, ranking the 11th in the district 2013 with four A's and also the first 15 rugby captain of the school. He was awarded the Venerable Prof. Valpola Sri Rahula Mahathir Memorial Gold Medal for being the best student out of the highest GP obtaining students in the Faculty of Management Studies and Commerce. He's also a Sri Lanka University Colorsman. Again, needless to say, that's not all he has achieved, but I will leave it to him to enlighten you all. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Sahan, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, Chirant, it was a nice, nice presentation. You gave us valuable insights from your experiences. So we'll talk about the commerce stream now. I will be specific on what parts you have uh, there in the commerce stream. So we'll move on to the presentation. Hope you can see my screen. 
is it okay then we'll continue uh, now after a levels you will be thinking there are so many options now as i summarize there are around five options main options do a degree do a professional qualification develop your soft skills go for a job do nothing for some time now after a levels even i was thinking oh, i studied so much now it's very tired full so i must watch some tv series play some games buy a good computer pc or uh, playstation and play some games likewise we will think like that that's natural that's natural but uh, my advice is not to do that use that time to develop your soft skills soft skills in the sense in the uh, previous presentation done by chiranti she told there are a lot of soft skills as she mentions leadership skills team play skills presentation and communication skills and uh, most importantly how to live in the society so these things you can develop you can join to uh, join for toastmaster clubs to develop your presentation and communication skills and also um, when coming when you are coming to the university most of the students will struggle because of english they will have the knowledge they will have the ability but because of this english factor they will not perform well in the university now i am experiencing it as a lecturer also as a student as a past student and the thing is after a levels you can do a degree and simultaneously with the degree you can do a professional qualification i will show you what are the professional qualifications that are available for you as a common students according to my uh, my view common students are the ones who have the best available options that means they can diverse the, the sector they can go is very diversified as i told um, this doing a degree doing a degree um, wait a second doing a degree a professional qualification and developing your soft skills can be done simultaneously can be done simultaneously and i will show you how it will be done and uh, i also did it i also did it so i will guide you how that can be achieved moving on the first one as i understand the best option for you is to go for a degree because um, we'll uh, discuss about the advantages of a degree in a university when you are going for a university it is not just a place for academics that means learning things studying writing exams that's not a university when you are going for a university that is the place you will learn about the society you will learn things in the school but university it is a different background a yeah, lot of uh, people from now as we know most of us are from uh, either male schools or female schools that is the thing um, some of us um, were in uh, mixed schools but the thing is when you are going for university you will meet friends from different gender you will meet friends from uh, different religions okay uh, people with different levels in the society likewise you will meet a so uh, sri lankan society there in the university and also when you are entering a university it will give you an huge opportunity to develop your soft skills in the university there are, there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for you guys to join in extra curricular activities extra curricular activities such as um, uh, being a part of a, a, a club like rot track um, in track clubs leo clubs and there are various student unions and uh, sport teams sports councils like this there are a lot of clubs you can join so when you are joining these clubs and when you are um, moving with these people you will automatically get gain these soft skills these soft skills will be gained automatically when you are doing these things and also when you are completing a degree it might give you a chance to get exemptions in certain qualifications as an example now if you 
do the accounting special degree in University of Jaya, Sri Jawardhanapura, you only need to do the SIMA final case study. Got it? And also uh, in other universities like uh, Peradhan University, if you uh, do the accounting and finance degree, also you need only to do the case study in SIMA examination. Now, if you finish the degree and as soon as you finish the degree, if you start um, uh, applying for this SIMA ASTAR program, and if you are able to pass the case study as uh, uh, with the degree, you will be qualified in SIMA also. So likewise in ACA, in Chartered, in AAT, and all other prof professional qualifications, you will get exemptions. And you will directly move on to, this is, this is very important things because uh, most of the students don't know about this one. Sri Lanka Qualification Framework, SKLQF, and National Vocational Qualification Level, NVQL. You might have seen this one when um, people are, those uh, foreign agencies are advertising their jobs in uh, foreign countries. You might have seen this. I will explain these things later. And also when you are applying for permanent residencies in different countries, if you have seen this, um, uh, the marking scheme of these uh, countries where you can apply for PR, degree will have a huge mark. That means undergraduate degree, master degree and PhD degrees will have different types of marks, but having a degree is a good choice. Now we'll move on to the degrees. What are the available degrees in Sri Lanka as a Sri Lankan student? So in state universities, there are around 17 state universities, including the Bhikshu uh, Vishwidyalaya, the uh, Visual Performance and Arts, and uh, the um, uh, Ayurvedic one in Gampaha. Uh, out of 17 these universities, 11 universities will conduct management programs, will conduct management programs. Other than that, um, open universities also a part of state universities. They will have different branches. The Colombo branch is in Naval, Candy one is in Polgol, uh, likewise in Amradapura, Jaffna, Badulla, they will have different branch. So you can choose a degree in a state university, open university, and also you can do degrees external degrees in uh, state universities, such as University of Sri Jawaradhanapura, University of Kalania, and in University of Peradhanapura, there is a there is an online external degree, which is very uh, popular these days. And you can do degrees in private universities, which are local private universities, and also in private foreign universities. So as Chiranti um, mentioned, there are a lot of degrees available in Sri Lanka at the moment. But make sure students, when you are choosing a degree, see whether it is recognized by the UGC, recognized by the UGC of Sri Lanka. Moving on, now I told you about Sri Lanka qualification framework and the national vocational qualification level. So this is a guideline prepared by UGC. Now, if you are learning, now, if you are willing to go to a job, they will mention these things, which level is expected from you for this job, likewise. Now, these are the levels. The first level is SKL, SLQF 1. That means that is O level. Now, as, as I know, all of you have done O levels. So you are qualified in level 1. Then when you finish level, uh, finish your advanced level, you are in level two. Likewise, when you complete a degree, you can go here directly to level five. And if you do a, do a special degree, that means four year degree, if you did a four year degree, you can go to the level six. And if you do a, do a general degree, you will be end up in, in level five and you will be end up in an uh, NVQL seven that will be your level and also um, uh, some students if they have a high gpa they can move on to slql 10 that means students uh, sorry uh, that means uh, 
the phd level the phd level so that is the highest level you can go in the sri lankan qualification framework then uh, if you are selecting a state university in sri lanka this is the guideline issued by the ugc now most commonly we will do business studies economics and accounting as a commerce student but you don't need to do all of these three subjects to get into a management related area if you do uh, two of these subjects and one of these subjects look at these ones agricultural science geography business statistics german combined mathematics likewise now if i know this before i will do combined mathematics economics and accounting why is that the base of economics and accounting will be combined mathematics so uh, uh, as some of you know i did mathematics for my a levels first then i changed my stream into commerce within 6 months i i was able to get a district rank and four a's in the commerce stream okay so uh, if i know a new this combination before i might have done economics accounting and combined mathematics got it so when we are talking about um, the management faculties in sri lanka uh, these are the universities that will offer you management degrees these um, universities such as uh, colombo university and uh, university of peradeniya will offer you bba degrees that means bachelor of business administration university of sri jawardhanapura will offer a bsc degree that means bachelor of science in management special university such as kalania will offer bbm degrees bm bbm means bachelor of business management then um, you can also apply for public management degrees state management and valuation bachelor of commerce and management studies as well as business information systems so these are specifically related to economics accounting and other things but um, according to the ugc you can also as management students you can also apply to these areas now see how wide is your area is you can either apply to law if you satisfy certain entry requirements of this um, faculty you can apply it colombo law faculty or peradeniya uh, law degree you can apply and also look at these things information technology quantity surveying mm, computation and management sports science and management physical education now most of my friends are sportsmen so they apply to this sports science and management degree so they are good in sports so they apply to this degree uh this will be offered by university of sri jawardhanapura and university of sabargamo so these days uh, they are calling for applications so in the ugc website and in many uh, newspapers you might find the advertisement regarding this degree so this is also a very good degree if you have a passion for sports and if you have done commerce and uh, you can go for this degree and there are other streams also like financial engineering this will be provided by university of kalania department of finance project management landscape architecture now as i told you commerce student will have a diversified options when selecting a degree and changing your path and changing your path you don't now most of the people will think if you did commerce they are thinking that you should be an accountant you should be an accountant so in management also there are a lot of functions functions in the sense uh, there can be accounting and finance operations hrm human resource management marketing management business administration so these are the functions in management for these different functions you can be specialized specialized for these different functions and the next one i will talk about the professional qualifications you can go for 
as management students what are the professional qualifications available now uh, most probably after o levels and after a levels there is a time lag that means uh, after all your results are released you will stay around 6 months at home so in that time if you are planning to do commerce you will go for double at so that's the trend in sri lanka you will go for double at at because you will learn some concepts in economics accounting before you go for your a level classes and also um, there will be a huge time gap after finishing a levels and entering the universities it is around one and a half years so it is a, it is a, it is a, it is actually a problem in sri lankan education system that time should be reduced one and a half years at home means it is a huge time because in foreign universities um, they will enter uh, foreign students will enter for the foreign universities in um, when they are around 19 years old so we are entering the university around 20 to 21 years so there is a problem and also in when we are talking about accounting you will be having double at chartered accountancy and acca as professional qualifications this accounting management accounting finance are three different fields but when i am studying uh, when i was studying um, a levels at that time i thought accounting management accounting finance these are similar things but actually these are drastically different things accounting management accounting and finance so if you need to specialize in accounting you can go for these professional qualifications and as i mentioned you if you are having a degree in accounting you can directly go for the double at membership without doing it you can go directly be a member of double at got it but in cs sri lanka they will give some exemptions for some degree program such as accounting degree in jayawardenapur kalania and uh, kalambu i think uh, you can go for the website and serve what are the exemptions available and aka uk aka also will be giving many exceptions if you have a degree if you have a degree that's why i am highlighting if you have a degree you can achieve these professional qualifications also then management accounting now this is sima is also uh, very popular even i did sima after my a levels and i i was able to get a world rank also world rank 6th in financial operation subject likewise this sima is also very popular now even engineers will do their bachelor's in engineers and they will do sima and will join in a company as a manager why is that why is that because these engineers can think logically and they will do sima and join the management field that means they are taking out the jobs of a commerce student jobs of a commerce student and um, there is another qualification called cma certified management accountant and uh, when we are talking about the finance field finance field means uh, as commerce students you know in accounting you will prepare the financial statements in finance what finance people will do is making decisions based on the reports provided by accounting so this is also very interesting area to get a uh, professional qualification in finance you can do cisi chartered institute for securities and investment and cfa cfa is one of uh, one of um, difficult exams in sri lanka in order to do cfa you need to have another professional qualification or you must complete a degree in order to do this cfa and if you like to move to the marketing field in management you can do cim chartered institute of marketing and you can be a charter holder charter holder means the, a member of that professional body and if you are loving to do human resource management if you are a good team player you love to work with people you can do chartered institute of uh, you can get the charter from the chartered institute of personal management and if you are like uh, like to do a job in bank 
you can get, go for Institute of Bankers Sri Lanka to get their professional qualification. So these are the things. Now, can you see there are a lot of professional qualifications available in Sri Lanka for commerce students. As I previously showed you, there are a lot of degrees and a lot of professional qualifications. But the thing is, as Chiranti mentioned, whatever the degree we have, okay, whatever the professional qualification you have, when you are entering for the job market, it will just be a pass or a receipt to your interview. When you face the interview, they will actually don't, they will not even, I, I have experienced it not in academic interviews, but in uh, industry interviews. Uh, when I went to interviews, they are not going to ask uh, what, what was the result for your, how many years did you get? Likewise, they are not going to ask. They will test your personality. As uh, Chirant mentioned, they will give you a real life scenario and they will ask, what will you do if this is the case, likewise, they will ask. So don't think if you are having a degree and a professional qualification degree with the first class will secure you a job. No, it won't happen. You must be able to show them your soft skills, your communication. Now think, you have, the, you have all the knowledge you need. Okay, you know how to do everything. But if you are not able to communicate it, What's the point? What's the point if you if you are not able to present it or communicate it? And you need to work as a team member in a company. And if you don't uh, know how to move in a team, how to work with the team, then there is no value of you, even though you are having a degree or a professional qualification. And also think uh, you are unique. Everyone is unique. That means, now think uh, you might have many role models. You might have brothers. You might have a father. Now, as uh, Chiranti mentioned, she was uh, willing to uh, take her father's job. So likewise, you, you will have role models. You'll have brothers, sisters, and other characters. The thing is, think you are unique. Actually, we are unique. Now, if you are thinking, uh, uh, thinking about our face in modern smartphones, you have facial recognition software. It will recognize your face because it is unique. And your iris, the iris is unique. Your voice, your tone will be unique. Okay, Your DNA will be unique. Even your heartbeat is unique. And also the way you walking will be unique. The most common one you know is our fingerprint or the signature is considered as unique. So if our body is unique, if you are different from each other, it will not tell you if you are going to follow the same path as a successful person did, it will not ensure that you will also be successful. So the thing is, you must identify what are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, as commerce students, you have studied this. In business studies also, you have studied this. Soft analysis is used to analyze the internal and external factors. Internal and external factors. So analyze yourself using soft analysis because you are the only one who knows your weaknesses your mother and father your brothers sisters will know some of your strengths and weaknesses but actually you are the only person who will know your strengths and weaknesses internally and also you are the only one who knows what are the opportunities you have what are the connection you have and uh, what are the future potential threats you will face you are the one who will know it. So do a soft analysis um, about yourself when you are going to decide your path. What degree should I do? What management function should I choose? Uh, is it better for me to move into low college? Now at Jayavaratanpur, when I, I was an undergraduate, 
uh, my batch was around uh, 1200 students out of them around uh, 50 to 60 students were in the law college because they need to change their path after getting a management degree they might practice law or they will become a legal officer in a leading company so that is their passion that is what they love and also do what you love don't always think about the monetary things that means the salary don't think every time don't think about the salary do what you love and what you have the passion for got it then and also uh, when you are learning and uh, going for the job market these are the top 10 skills which will be uh, needed for you to join a good company so this was um, uh, uh, published by the world economics forum that means they will get research from um, what uh, the 500 fortune companies and the world best companies so the, now as an example you know elon musk is the owner of tesla paypal and uh, spacex he's the one who sent uh, a private space uh, craft to the orbit recently so students uh, here these are the top main skill analytical thinking and innovation okay active learning complex problem solving leadership and social social influence creativity now when you are reading these things can you find anything known as degree or academic qualification or professional qualification can you find anything like that so now can you understand having a degree or a professional qualification will not assure you a job while doing a degree and a professional qualification you must be able to develop these skills also problem solving skills now if you are doing a sport now I did rugby. Now in rugby, we need to make decisions in milliseconds. Now, if you consider about the fly half, when he received the ball, I hope some of you know rugby. Huh? When uh, when a fly half receive a ball, he need to make a decision whether to kick it, whether to pass it or run. He will decide it in milliseconds. So these things will be practiced. As you know, uh, most of the rugby players, basketball players will join good jobs in a uh, mercantile field. Why is that? They might not have some uh, uh, good academic qualifications and all, but they will get that job. Why is that? Because they have this skill, problem skill, uh, uh, solving skill, and they will um, be having team playing skills. Likewise, the companies will identify these skills. Got it? Creativity, people management, and if when in a university, we are giving students assignments, assignments as a group activity, group presentation. So now as in practice and rock practice, you are also doing this as a group work. So your skills are developing automatically. You will develop how to handle people. Now, when, when I was the president of the sports council in the University of Sri Javardhanapura, I need to handle both... Uh, uh, that means uh, people from different religious backgrounds, people from different genders, okay, people who are supporting ragging, who are not supporting ragging. Likewise, we need to balance everyone. So these things will be practically learned when you go for these um, council works, uh, sports, and also these CSR activities. While when you are joining for CSR activities, you will understand about the society and it will definitely add you a good value also. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. Hope you got some new insights about the commerce team. And uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, you can uh, use the chat box and uh, someone will moderate it. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much for that wonderful speech, sir. I believe it was more than helpful. And now, before we move on to the question and answer session, I would like to thank and recognize our sponsors for the event. Media partner, Chocolate. Learning partner, iTutor. Knowledge partner, EasyLink Academy. It's a pleasure to have you on board. Also, another minor announcement. Uh, we conducted a session, session related to the topic, how to score at an interview during the last phase of our project. And there were a lot of questions regarding CVs asked there. Therefore, the organizing committee will be accepting CVs and directing them to HR professionals. And the question and the owners of those CVs will be sent, will receive the feedback, personal feedback from them. So if anyone's interested, uh, feel free to contact one of the co-hosts or your relevant club member. And with that being said, let's move on to the question and answer session. While all this was happening, we've received a lot of questions. Let's see who the, let's see which the, let's see which one is the first. Okay, so this one is more lenient towards Miss uh, Chiranti's speech. Can you please explain the pathway for international relationships for students who did languages for A levels? Ms. Chiranti, your thoughts? Yes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure whether this actually was the question that either Anisha or Anisha also sent to me privately, but I would actually like to answer this openly so that it's beneficial for everyone. So in international relations, just to give you a very summarized answer, there are two types of job opportunities. One is ambassadorial job opportunities. That's where you represent your country in another country as an ambassador. The second type of job opportunity is what we call embassy-based job opportunities. So that's where, for example, you can stay in your country and work for an embassy of another country, right? So the requirements for each of these two uh, pathways are different. If you want to be an ambassador for your country, then you have to write the administrative exams that are organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka. They gazette it every year or once every two years based on the vacancies in the ministry. So once you sit for the administrative exams, I think the top, um, I'm not sure the exact number, but I think between 10 to 20 people are chosen to start their work or career path at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then you have to your foreign affairs is your only pathway for an ambassadorial job opportunity. But if you're going for something like working in an embassy, the embassies have so many op like job, job openings. Like if you take a look at, let's say, top jobs or a job portal like that, the US embassy, for example, recently had actually advertised for a, a researcher in economics, right? So there are, you don't essentially have to be from the international relations background because they have program office opportunities, researcher opportunities. They even have managerial opportunities. Uh, you know, they sometimes even look for commerce students to lead their um, financial wings. So embassy-based opportunities are very diverse, but in either case, what I would actually suggest is to have a basic grounding in international relations or any social science because it actually helps. Thank you so much. And, uh... Thank you. Mr. Ayatna, uh, is there anything you would like to add to that? Um, I think that's all uh, because I don't know uh, much about the languages that stream. Chiranti explained it very well. Okay, sir. And the second question, also more lenient towards Ms. Chiranti's speech. What are the ways to enter the field of diplomacy like Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Forgive me. What are the alternative methods to do a law, to do law other than law faculty and law college? Is Ms. Chiranti here?
So until then, why don't we move on to the next question? Okay, we'll do. Uh, hold on. Let me just. Okay, so this question, I believe, will be directed towards uh, Mr. Uvinayaratna. Can you please explain the pathways for? Oh my God, I'm I'm terribly sorry. I'm I'm facing a minor problem here. What are your advices to a person who wants to be an entrepreneur? Do you recommend any courses? Yes, there are a lot of entrepreneurship courses, but the thing is, uh, you must know what is the path of your entrepreneurship. That means uh, when you are going for going to become an entrepreneur, usually you will go for a thing you love. Now, uh, one of my colleagues, colleague uh, was there in the marketing department. He produced something called cost posture. That is uh, similar to summer posture. Now, these things he didn't learn in uh, learned as a degree, but these are the ideas that generated in his mind. So, uh, when you are going to become an entrepreneur, you must be able to think logically, and you must be able to be very creative. So, uh, that depends on your qualities. And if you need to improve these things and learn about entrepreneurship, you will have different uh, degree programs also. In uh, University of Sri Jawaharlal also, we have a degree on entrepreneurship. So you can follow that one. And uh, in some universities also, they have this entrepreneurship degree that you can gain knowledge about entrepreneurship and uh, they will be conducting this uh, degree in a practical way. That means the, the students will have the opportunity to meet the entrepreneurs and get their insights, the knowledge. How And uh, the thing is, as I mentioned, you cannot go in the similar path as that successful person to become an entrepreneur. You must find the solution for the problem that is depending on you and also you must have luck also a bit luck a bit of luck okay and um, sahan there are some questions that um, uh, students directly sent me after you uh, your questions i will answer them also yeah, sure. I believe we have enough time for that. Is that is will that be a problem, Salim? Yeah, we have time till late thirty. So, yeah, okay. Uh, sure. uh, we have okay. So the next question also more lenient towards Mr. Uvin's speech. What are the highly demanded management fields in Sri Lanka as well as the world? Yes. Now. Uh, most of you common students are planning to go for the accounting stream. The highest demand is for that. But the thing is the accounting will be replaced by computer softwares. That means uh, you will not be doing uh, accounting uh, manually. You will have the ERP systems that will automatically, uh, when you sell something, it will be recorded and automatically the financial statements will also be prepared. Got it? But uh, now when we are thinking about other functions such as uh, HRM, marketing, finance. Now think about marketing. Marketing cannot be done using a computer software. You can design brands using Adobe Photoshop or you can do video editing and all you can do. But when it's come to decision making, there should be a human factor. Since in this uh, world today, we don't have any AIs, artificial intelligence to make decisions that is better than humans. That means human decisions will combine both emo emotional uh, factor and a logical factor. If it is only an AI, you will have that logical reasoning only. 
So when we are combining both of these two, we need humans. Got it? So when you are going for a field, I think uh, the highest demand will be for uh, it will depend it will depend okay it will depend from company to company from uh, country to country so fields like um, marketing hrm so human resource management you cannot do it using um, softwares got it so there there should be experience to manage human so human resource management uh, marketing operations management tourism hospitality management so these are the wide areas that should develop now in sri lanka sri lanka is named as one of the best tourism uh, destination so if you know about tourism management and hospitality management it will be a value adding in future so you must think about the future the volatility of the market the job opportunities you have otherwise if you cannot practically apply what are the things you are learning it will not be a point now think as, as an example now my mother my mother did botany special at university of teheradini now she is working as a librarian so likewise um, according to my view so uh, people do like that also now my father is also the uh, bachelor of science in uh, chemistry now he is uh, working as a deputy director at board of investment so they have, they have uh, changed their path they are not practicing anything they learned now he is not doing chemistry at uh, board of investment <laughs> likewise okay thank you sir uh, moving on to the next question uh also i i believe this is lenient to mr ranti uh career options from geography and gis in sri lanka or internationally okay um, and one more thing uh, if it will yes. it be if, if, is, is it fine, since we are running on severe time restraints is it fine if i give you the next question also and you can answer them briefly just to make sure yes please sure uh so the next question is are there any possibilities of following statistics economic courses in the state universities of sri lanka having done commerce in a levels yes um so i'll actually just answer the first question more because i think ovin may be better able to respond to the second one so with regards to but i'll add my perspective on the second one as well with regards to gis uh, i think that's uh, is is it greek and roman civilization i'm not very sure what gis stands for um but i think it's geography and <laughs> i'm sorry though i think it is greek and roman but um i did my it was in 2014 so that was a long time back so i may be mistaken but uh, what i would say is that if you are doing any sort of arts and languages oriented basket yes uh, it means geographic information system Oh right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um. So the that that's very interesting because um geographic information systems was one chapter when I did geography for A levels. I didn't know that this was uh like a completely different opportunity available now in A levels. That that's fantastic though. But if you are doing geography, what I would say is that um. the options that are available for you is uh, a lot of the arts faculties in many of the, the universities in sri lanka local universities have a separate geography department for example the faculty of arts university of colombo has a separate geography department so if you are doing geography and hoping to pursue geography as a higher study let's say to be uh, academic in the geography field or to even do geology then i would say it is best to get a degree that is specializing in geography itself and once you do your undergraduate degree in geography that would lead you to let's say to work as an academic in a university or you can even work for let's say the uh, meteorological department of sri lanka so there are like state and non state opportunities that are available for you but if you are specializing in geography then you would have to first may have a lot of career options It has a scientific component as well, so your options may be relatively limited. So that 
that's the first, I think, decision you will have to make. Uh, and with regards to the second question of statistics and um, I think economics, I think we would be better equipped to answer that question. But just know that especially in economics, there are the social science understanding of economics and the commercial understanding of economics. So a commercial economic degree is very different from a social science economic degree. Because social science economic degree is more towards understanding economics in the context mixed degree. So that was to do with development policy and management economics. Um, that is dif very different from what the common stream has to afford in terms of economics itself. And statistics will again allow you to do, um, you know, arts and oriented uh, courses like demography, geography, and there is again a social science aspect of statistics as well. But both economics and statistics has a commerce element to it also. Okay, Ms. Chiranti, we have one more question for you. Uh, what are the alternative methods to do law other than law faculty or law college? Okay, um, so if you are wanting to do law as an academic study, I would say you have to get your degree as, you have, as we call it LLB, Legum Bacillaris, which means Bachelor of Law, that's a Latin term. To do your LLB, you have to go to one of the three faculties in Sri Lanka locally. That's either the faculty of, sorry, the Department of Law in Jaffna, Faculty of Law in Peradeni, or Faculty of Law in University of Colombo. That's locally. In terms of doing a private degree, there are a lot of private universities in Sri Lanka that afford uh, the LLB, like University of London, uh, University of Wolverhampton. So if you have the financial capability, you can go to a private university as well. If you are having a financial restriction, then the uh, affordable LLB degree that is that you know, that you have to pay and do, unfortunately, is the open university LLB degree. That's in terms of the academics. But if you want to practice as a lawyer, unfortunately, you have to go through Sri Lanka Law College because that is the only institution that has the power to give you that license, right? If you don't finish Sri Lanka Law College, you can't practice in Sri Lanka as a lawyer. Um, so what I did was I actually, again, did both parallelly. I did my academic studies and my professional qualification together. So one thing that you need to know is if you are doing a private degree, uh, that's like in, for example, University of London or University of Wolverhampton, once you get your degree, you have so if you are going through the private route, it will take you about good six to six and a half years to be a lawyer if you're doing it one after the other. But if you can manage it parallelly, you actually cut down your time in half because you can sit for Sri Lanka Law College entrance exams with your A-level results and also do your LLB part-time in the weekend. Thank you. Uh, uh, will you be kind enough to explain uh, to name some local and private unis as an example, ma'am? Sure, they related to law, right? Yes. Okay, so if you are going to go for a local university approach, once you get your results, you will have to look at the UGC uh, administrative book to find what the cutoff mark is. Um, so when the law was 1.9, cutoff mark for Pera then it was 1.67 or 1.7. So, but I know that the numbers have changed drastically and it's not the same thing that was there five years ago, five to six years ago. Um, so you have to check what the uh, cutoff mark is. And there are only three um, faculties and departments in the local system that gives you law. That's the uh, Department of Law, University of Jaffna, Faculty of Law, University of Peradeniya, and Faculty of Law, University of Colombo. Once you finish your three, four, three year degree there, sorry, four year degree there, then the only advantage of studying at a local university and finishing the, or finishing the open university LLB degree is that you only have to do your final year at Sri Lanka Law College. That's like a privilege that is given to you simply because you are learning the Sri Lankan legal system. But if you go for a private approach, if you're going to pay for your degree and do it with a private university like University of London 
at University of Wolverhampton. So University of London, you can do the degree through Royal Institute, Horizon Campus or CFPS. University of Wolverhampton is through APIT. Um, so um, so you, you can actually do the degrees through these universities, but you have to do all three years worth of exams at Sri Lanka Law College as well. So I hope those uh, <laughs> lists are a little clear. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ramti. Uh, Mr. Wynn, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yes, Ria. Regarding the first question, that economics and statistics on, uh, if you did commerce, you can do economics. Uh, there is a degree called uh, business economics. And in that degree, you can study these economic concepts as well as statistics will be there. And uh, if you're going for an economic and statistics degree, actually, I don't know there are entry requirements, but in uh, Peradhan University, in Sabaragam University, in Colombo University, and these universities, they have a degree in economics and statistics. Please go to the UG. I will share you with you all the link uh, of the UGC handbook. So uh, I will share it now. You can go to this handbook and see the entry requirements of these degrees. Then you will understand what are the things they will be required. What are the subjects you must done? You must have been done in your A levels in order to enroll for this degree. Got it? Um, okay, Sahan. Any other questions? Uh, I believe. You had some questions, sir. That would yes, I have a lot of questions here. Um, yeah, you may select some which, uh, that you think yes. will be valuable for uh, our which university is the best? Japuro Kalambu. Now, uh, it's it's kind of uh, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, it's kind of a joking, conflicting question now. Um, so uh, when talking about um, uh, management. Uh, usually, as we know, most of the people are telling Japur is the best, and uh, I'm also from Japura. And Kalambu is also that means uh, we cannot choose what is the best. That is my opinion. Uh, to be honest, that is my opinion because uh, both Japura and Kalambu both are leading universities in teaching management. The thing is, Japura will uh, give you Bachelor of Science in management. And Colombo will offer bachelor in business administration. That, that is the only difference I see. Okay, and um, uh, there are another questions. Um, the demand for human resource management. Actually, there is a huge demand. Now, as uh, Chiranti mentioned, she was also went to a human resource management interview, right? So, uh, human resource management. Uh, is an interesting area and there is a huge demand because in every company who is working human resource and we, what is the most difficult resource to control human resource so there is a huge demand for good human resource managers got it and in the next question um, if you are weak in accounting, what are the degrees available? You have a lot of degrees that is not uh, touching accounting, but as a, as a basic subject or uh, an introductory subject, you, you must need to learn some basic concept of accounting when you are becoming a manager. The thing is now think, you are becoming a human resource manager. Now human resource manager is the one who is making the payrolls. Payrolls in the things, your salaries, the EPF calculations, ETF calculations. So if you are not good in do, doing those EPF and ETF calculation, the entire company will be in trouble because if you don't pay the EPF and ETF properly, there will be a legal issue from central bank. Central bank is the one who is uh, uh, controlling the EPF and ETF will be controlled now currently it is controlling by the Ministry of Finance. So you will have a legal issue. So when you are going for a degree, 
you need to have basic knowledge in accounting definitely you must have and also tax now think if you are i'm taking human resource as an example if you are a human resource manager you need to calculate pay tax pay as you earn so you need to have some knowledge about taxation also so it depends the thing is degrees like uh, marketing human resource management accounting these uh, subjects will only touch small amount in accounting syllabus so you can go for those degrees if you are not good in accounts but students the thing is in a level when you are doing a level accounting is very crucial subject when deciding the isets course okay think about that also and there is another question uh is it possible for someone who isn't very good in accounting to do a professional qualification like aca uh dear student aca is a professional qualification in accounting so if you are not good in accounting don't do aca because uh, aca is uh, completely focused in accounting so if you need to do some other professional qualifications in uh, management you can do sim chartered institute uh, become a charter in market marketing and you can do um, uh, in ipm uh, institute of personal management you can do their professional qualification if you are not good in accounting these are the fields you can go in management got it and uh, i will briefly explain these things because time is not permitting us the next one yes uh, because of the pandemic do we have a job market for commerce students definitely yes because um, most of these functions can be done online now think of accounting now some of my friends for around 6 months they are at home now because accounting can be done using a computer if he get the required data and information he can prepare the accounts management accounting also can be done at home the only thing is uh, when everyone is not uh, in uh, at the office human resource management also can be done online is it, is that so so now you are organizing your um, in fact uh, workshops and all you are not meeting no you are doing it virtually right so it is possible because now this is the new normal we need to use to adapt and new business opportunities will be there for you so don't worry there will be job opportunities after the pandemic or within this pandemic period there will be job opportunities even interviews interviews are conducting online now most of the job interviews are conducting online they are recruiting online and uh, they are not going to the office even got it so you have the chance the next one uh, uh, online in business management courses are available where in a state university now today today morning also i did a external uh, lecture for uh, bba online at peradini university okay you can go to the internet and search cdce center for distance and continuous education at peradeniya so you can find a business management degree there online one as you requested and there are some other online degrees offered by university of kalania and uh, others uh, some of them will include some private ones also but make sure when you are doing a degree or selecting a online degree check whether it is recognized by the ugc it is very important to know that otherwise when you complete the degree and if you are going for interview and when they are checking your uh, qualifications and if that is a fake institution which is providing degrees it's not going to work for you just your money will be lost then there are some other questions uh, so if you yes, there are stick, stick to the Sorry? most important ones because we are running under okay okay five, five 
ओके डियर स्टूडेंट्स इफ यू हैव क्वेश्चन यू कैन सेंड मी थ्रू मेसेंजर फेसबुक बिकॉज आई आई हैव रिसीव अराउंड ट्वेंटी फाइव क्वेश्चन आई कैनोट इवन रीड दीज थिंग्स ओके सो यू कैन सेंड मी थ्रू मेसेंजर देन आई विल हेल्प यू आई विल हेल्प यू actually some of the questions i don't know so i will skip it honestly uh, okay doing languages and hope to join forward bank yes you can do i told you uh, if you can do a professional qualification in banking okay institution of bank of sri lanka you can do one and also in order to work in a bank now these days um, if you have noticed they have advertised management trainees for uh, bank of ceylon so look at their criteria you can also apply even math students these all of these students can apply this uh, uh, for this banking field now uh, uh, moving on to the other questions yes uh, cim uh, in marketing you can do uh, uh, the time is not permitted right students you can send me through messages these questions because uh, it will take even time to read these questions so uh, please uh, send me these questions to uh, Uh, messenger or oh, i will share my email with the with this group then you, you can contact me thanks okay, a lot thank you, sir. sir thanks a lot miss it was really helpful it was a really wonderful session done by both of you and with that we have come to the end of our question and answer session and we have sent you all feedback forms please do fill them and send it back to us and now lastly but not least the word of thanks to wrap up i would like to invite road tractor sadni to propose the word of thanks thanks sir mr owen ayaratna and miss chiranthi senaayaka our most valued invited guest speakers and dear road tractors and interactors as we come to the close of the day first day of the uh, project path find a phase 2 i deem it a great honor to propose the word of thanks to all i on behalf of interact clubs and road track clubs let me call it fraternity of here together and on my own behalf extend a hearty word of thanks to all the speakers for praising your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today i must mention our deep sense of uh, appreciation for mr win aryaratna for his great address on the commentary further we are grateful to ms chiranthi senanayaka for demonstrating her address on arts and languages tree we are all inspired by your great words i also extend my thanks to all the participants participants for their enormous cooperation in the organization and participation in this event thank you very much stay safe thank you and that brings us to the end of today's session Once again thank you all for your cooperation i hope everyone here has an idea of what they want to do afterwards after the whole session and we hope the very best for your own futures thank you have a good night and stay safe